And uh, thank you all for joining us. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. I'm, uh, I said each day this week I build up to a more aggressive Packers tie. So today's pretty subtle still. I'll get the fluorescent uh, green and gold that went out tomorrow. But I, uh, I haven't yet got connected with uh, Governor um, Jerry Brown out in California. You know, we're going to put up some beer and some cheese and some good stuff like that. Last week, Governor Dayton uh, in Minnesota was actually in for back surgery. So he was sedated towards the end of the week and his staff decided maybe he shouldn't make a, a bet. Well, I tried to tell him on Monday uh, that while he was under, they had negotiated that the bet was uh, that either state, the one that won, the other state had to pay off our tax reciprocity between Minnesota <laughs> and Wisconsin. So I thought it would be a pretty good deal for any of you up in St. Croix or Polk or County or Burnett. I uh, know how much uh, that would be nice, but uh, we're still working on that. Um, I also though, had a little fun with, with him and, and other friends from Minnesota. I tell them that uh, uh, yet again after the game last Saturday night, uh, the Minnesota Vikings and a car thief are still very much alike. Neither of them have a title. So it's, uh, it's, it's just brutal. If, uh, if you've got any Vikings fans, you can rub that in. I, I, this season, I, I, I didn't run into too many Lions fans up uh, near the UP, but if I did, I'd remind them that the Lions don't have a website. It's because they can't put three W's in a row anymore, but uh, that's a whole, <clears throat> whole nother ball game. <clears throat> yeah, don't encourage me. I'll keep going. Uh, I'll come with the Bears joke and the whole bit. But uh, again, thanks for having me. Sorry about my voice. You'd think after spending most of the morning working on the budget, I'd have a better voice. So it wasn't from talking, but uh, um, just, uh, I, I guess, from digesting all that's going on with the state budget. But we spent this morning, we'll spend this afternoon working on that. As Jeff mentioned, that'll be coming out. Uh, next month, <clears throat> but this Tuesday I'll be talking about the state of the state. I thought I'd give you a little bit of a preview in, in the sense that it really ties in to the focus on an economic forecast uh, for 2013 and beyond. Uh, first off, though, I think it's, it's worth just pausing for a moment and thinking about where we've been the last couple years. I mean, two years ago at this time uh, was right after I took the oath of office as your 45th governor, getting ready for our first state of the state and our first budget address and uh, think about where we were at. I mean, at that point, the beginning of 2011, we had a $3.6 billion budget deficit. Uh, property taxes and other taxes had just gone up in the past. We had gone through three years, 2008, 2009, and 2010, where during that time frame, we lost about 150,000 jobs. And at the low point during out that, uh, that time, the unemployment rate had creeped up to over 9%. Um, and at the time, uh, two years ago, unemployment was about 7.5%. Today, two years later, we had to make some tough, but I would argue prudent decisions. And in turn, unlike what we see in Washington, unlike what we even see with our neighbors, now instead of a budget deficit, we have a budget surplus. And in total, we have about a half a billion dollars in reserve between our surplus and money we've set aside for the rainy day fund. So talk about a fundamental turnaround. $3.6 billion in the whole to half a billion dollars in terms of total reserve. In fact, as the Lieutenant Governor who's with me here today, Rebecca Clayfish and I both know that for us it was a, a fundamental turnaround, but an important pathway, uh, not just for fiscal responsibility, for what, what it means in the economy as well. I mean, think about it. the last two years, first time ever in two consecutive years, we've set money aside in the rainy day fund. We went from losing jobs to gaining jobs. Our unemployment rates down to 6.7 percent. Property taxes went down for the first time in 12 years on a median value at home. But most importantly, we helped provide stability, something I know that when it comes to financial institutions uh, in particular, uh, I talked to a group of commercial real estate folks earlier this morning in Milwaukee in the same way in, in their industry, you want certainty. You want stability. It's something that, uh, that in particular, the, the rest of, of, of folks in your communities look to our banks as being a stable source of financial uh, stability and, and, and certainty in the community. Certainly, we need to provide that uh, in the state. And I, I want to thank uh, Peter as our, our Secretary of the Department of Financial Institutions, who's here as well, who's, I think, provided that kind of stability and, and certainty in DFI. We'll continue to work with our financial institutions here today and those that you represent. But we need to provide that in government. And so you look as a contrast, I didn't tell a Bears joke, but maybe that's because I was warm enough to pick on Illinois, but you look in contrast to what is happening or is not happening in Illinois, you know, they, like most states two years ago, just as we did, had a budget deficit. But they chose to handle it differently. 
They raised taxes, 67% on individuals, 46% on businesses. A year later, they were still facing budget challenges and crises. In fact, they talked about closing 14 state facilities, laying off thousands of public employees. As we've just seen yet again this week, you saw yesterday's Wall Street Journal and again pointed out to the pension problems they have down there. Uh, they have a system where their budget's in crisis. They've cut more than a billion dollars from Medicaid and more on top of that. They're getting IOUs for a lot of their state contracts. They have a pension system that's the worst funded in the country, less than half of their unfunded liability. Uh, and they have a bond rating that, that competes with uh, Illinois for the, or excuse me, competes with California's for the worst in the nation. In contrast, we avoided massive layoffs. We avoided the massive tax increases. We actually put a billion debt plus dollars, almost 1.3 billion more into Medicaid to fund programs for needy families, children, and seniors in this state. And we did all that without raising taxes, and we did it in a way that ultimately provided stability. We have the only, the only pension system in the country that's fully funded and a bond rating that's considered to be credit positive by our bond rating agencies. We think that's a nice contrast not only to Illinois, but to Washington, D.C. and others across this country. So that's the kind of stability that's not only good when it comes to dollars and cents, it's particularly important uh, when it comes to economics. Because I believe for employers, the employers that come to you, the businesses that come to you and ask for that loan to move forward and to buy that equipment that allows them to put people to work in this state and in your community, uh, they need to have the certainty of knowing that in this state and in their communities, there's going to be stability as well. The choices we made over the last two years, as difficult as they were, now looking back seem to be pretty prudent, pretty reasonable. Because today, not only our state, but our local governments are able to balance our budget, not just one time, but from a long-term perspective. What we did ultimately was about making decisions that thought more about the next generation than we did about the next election. Isn't that what you elect us to do? So now, having laid the framework, what I want to do is, is moving forward, talk to you a little bit about not just a preview of next week's speech and of the budget itself, but, but tell, tell you where we'd like to go over the next couple of years. Uh, what I mentioned in our listening sessions, we call them Talk with Walker. We went with, in November and December, uh, we went all across the state. We went to different employers, different sizes, different locations, and sat down and, and talked with employees and talked about what I believe are our top five priorities of things we want to focus in on both with the legislature and in our budget over the next five years. Uh, we got great feedback. In fact, we've made a, a number of adjustments in our, in our budget work that we're preparing on for February based upon those discussions, but we essentially got great feedback in terms of the overall five priorities. Uh, the suggestions were more on how to meet those objectives. So let me run through those and then talk for a moment on each of them. First off, create jobs. Secondly, develop the workforce. Third, transform education. Fourth, reform our, our government. And fifth, make prudent investments in our infrastructure. And let me spend just a minute or two on each of those. Certainly when it comes to creating jobs, uh, that's something that you hear from every person who ran for office last year. Didn't matter if you were running for president, governor, dog catcher, you were talking about creating jobs because that's on the top of people's minds. Uh, and so we're committed to that, we're focused on that. Uh, for us, it means a variety of things. Certainly. Uh, in the near future, we're talking a lot about mining legislation uh, because we have a company that's willing to invest a billion and a half dollars in this state, an investment that, uh, that ultimately can lead to as many as 3,000 construction-related jobs and about 2,800 long-term permanent jobs either at or related to the mine itself. And it's not just up in Iron or Ashland County. Uh, it's down at a place not too far from here in Clinton. It's over in Prairie du Chien. It's up in the town of Scott outside of Green Bay. It's in Eau Claire and Wausau and many other businesses I've talked to around the state, big and small alike, who would benefit because of the work provided that's related uh, to that kind of long-term generational work that'll come out of that mine there. Now, I often say, when you think about the flag here, which I'll, I'll digress for one second just because I love history. Uh, to, this is just barely, but 2013, which means it's now the 150th anniversary of that flag, but you didn't know that. You can go home and impress your family, uh, your kids in particular, and tell them, you know, the flag says 1848 on it, but the flag wasn't officially put together and, and made official until 1863, midway through the Civil War. 
Through the Civil War, we had soldiers at the front of the Civil War, 91,000 strong that fought from Wisconsin, which was pretty amazing at the time because it was one out of every nine men, woman, and child in the state, so a pretty amazing impact. But at the time, they said in addition to fly, the, flying the old glory and leading that in the battle, they wanted to remember the folks from back home. So they asked for something, and uh, my predecessors, uh, the folks in state government at the time, sent them a blue flag uh, with the state seal on it. The reason I tell you that, other than impressing you with my historical knowledge, is that if you look at the flag on the seal itself, there's two people on it. The guy on the right's a miner. If you look at the shield on it, the upper right-hand corner of it has got a pickaxe and a shovel because of mining. And most importantly, if you look at the top of the seal, right underneath the, the state model forward, what is there? There's a badger. Now, I don't know how many of you hunt like I do, but when I go hunting, I have never ran into a badger. And thank goodness, because badgers get pretty ticked off if you corner them, right? We're the badger state, not because there's a lot of badgers in our state any more than there are in Iowa or Minnesota or anywhere else. We're the badger state because just down the way, over in Grant and Lafayette and Iowa County, long before we were state, our ancestors who came to what's now Wisconsin came because they were miners. And they literally, before they had a home to live in, would dig into the sides of the deposits in the, in the hills there and would literally put up a piece of canvas and live there for a while until they'd made enough money and had enough time to build a home. And the early inhabitants of the state at the time nicknamed them badgers because they burled into their home just like a badger does. The reason I tell you that is if there's any state in America that should be able to streamline the process for safe and environmentally mining, shouldn't it be the badger state? A state that was founded in part based on mining? Now, other core industries in the state, like tourism and agriculture, depend on clean air, clean land, clean water. So we're not going to do it in a way that, that conflicts with those priorities. But you can balance the two, as we've showed in others. You can have a balance. And when we've got as many as 3,000 jobs in the construction, 2,800 in the permanent placement of that mine, doesn't it make sense that we'd pursue a process it doesn't officially approve the mine, it just streamlines the process. So if you've got a company willing to make a billion and a half dollar investment, we're saying we're not going to change the rules several times throughout the process itself. That's one of the big things we're going to be talking about in the next couple of months, and I hope Democrat and Republican alike, the legislature is willing to act on. Now, on top of that, creating jobs means more than just one specific bill. What we believe is, since we're blessed to be in a position where we have a surplus instead of a deficit, we're not going to blow it. We're not going to go hog wild. We're not going to spend all the money in a way that puts us in a deficit position like we inherited. But we do believe that one of the best ways to get the economy going even greater than it is right now is to put more money back in the hands of consumers and more money in particular in the hands of small businesses. Now, as probably most, if not all of you know, most of our employers in the state, most of the small businesses in Wisconsin don't pay corporate income tax. We pay individual income taxes. LLCs, sub F scores, others like that. And so for us, one of the biggest bangs for our buck is dropping the individual income tax rate, putting more money back in the hands of consumers and small business owners out there so that they in turn can invest that money, they can take out loans, they can move forward and put people to work. Well, we're committed to doing that. So we're going to lay out some more details next week and then put out the significant details in the budget about how we're going to lower the individual income tax rate in this state and really make a down payment a down payment on long-term income tax relief in the state of Wisconsin because I believe, and I think the majority of people in the state believe, the money's better spent in your hands. It's one of the frustrations I've had with some of the stuff they've done in Washington is I, I, I understand the fiscal significance of what's going on, uh, but from an economic standpoint, it concerns me when folks think that your money is better spent in their pocket in Washington than it is out in the economy here in Wisconsin and across this country. And so we want to put more money back into the economy, not into the hands of government. In addition, I want to talk just for a minute or two on, on the other five or the other four areas uh, as part of our five priorities. Along with creating jobs, one of the things that goes hand in hand with that and probably uh, all of you here, if you've bumped into other employees around the state, you've, you've heard them talk about it as well, and that is developing the workforce. You know, one of our great assets in this state is the quality of our workforce. I, I hear time and time again from employers who tell me they have operations outside of the state 
that when they start up in a number, another state, one of the things they frequently have to do is bring workers from Wisconsin because they don't have the quality and the work ethic in those other states to start the type of operation that they expect out of what they get here in this state. And, and so they mention it all the time. So it's one of our strengths, but it's also one of our challenges, particularly in key clusters. If you look in manufacturing for sure, but also in information technology, in healthcare, heck, even in some areas in, in finance and accounting, we have huge gaps between the jobs that are open and having enough people with the skill sets from two year to four year degrees and everything in between, the skill sets that are needed to fill those jobs. So one of the things we're trying to do is, is do a better job of connecting the dots, not just for kids coming out of our K through 12 system, although that's a part of it. We're gonna outline some more plans in the future about how we do a better job of preparing young people for the jobs that are open, not just today, but in the foreseeable future. On top of that, not only for young people, but for others coming uh, who've been in the workforce and need to come back into it in our technical colleges, doing a better job of saying, if we're gonna spend money there, particularly if we're gonna put additional resources into our technical colleges, should we put them in the areas where we get a return that's specific to the areas that we have openings in? I mean, I'll give you a good example. I, I uh, have an employer I visited over in Northwest Wisconsin, not too, or excuse me, Northwest Milwaukee, uh, not too long ago, done Northwest Wisconsin as well, but Northwest Milwaukee, uh, where small business, he's got two shifts, about 25 employees per shift. Uh, he's in uh, manufacturing, actually does the, is a supplier for uh, two of our larger mining equipment companies. He does the buckets on the front there and he used high skilled welders and machinists in particular. He told me, He's having trouble filling those spots, but if he could fill those spots and have confidence he'd continue to do that, he would literally add a third shift uh, to that business. That'd be another 25 people working, another 25 families that would benefit from that. But he said, I'm not willing to take that business on because I can't even fill the spots I have open today. Well, even though our employment rate's down to 6.7%, which is better than the national average, it's much better than our neighbors in Illinois and surrounding states, that's still too high. And so one of the things we have to do when we talk about jobs is not just go out and create more jobs, but make sure that the jobs that we have open today are being filled. And we can be a more aggressive of that, not only in our technical colleges, but even with our flexible degree program, we announced the University of Wisconsin called UW Flex Option, where we take about a quarter of all the people in the state who have some college credits without a college degree and plug them in to a program that makes it easier for them in their own time, in their own circumstances, to get that degree that matches up with the, the programs and services we have uh, needs in today, those are the things we need to act on. We're gonna be more aggressive on that. We not only have a short-term need, we have a long-term need as well, and that's where it goes beyond just workforce development into transforming our education system. You see, we, we have both a great challenge and a great opportunity. Uh, for anyone here today who's talked recently to your HR director, I would imagine there's a grave concern out there uh, as anyone in HR looks out for the next five, 10 years and realizes, you know, we have a tremendous number of people here in this state and for that matter across the country, either at or near retirement age. It's the first wave of baby boomers get into that retirement age. There's a whole wave of new openings that are gonna happen over the next five to 10 years. The challenge is from an HR standpoint is how do we ensure we have enough people to fill those spots? Uh, I, I see Kurt Bauer out here in the, in the crowd. Kurt's said this before, you pointed this out, I think last year at one of these events like this, that the state that can get the connection, not just in the short term in workforce development, but long term can show employers that we have a system, not just in our technical schools and our universities, but even in our K through 12 system, we have in place systems that will ensure that our employers who are here now, who wanna grow here and those who wanna come here are at the forefront of ensuring that we have the skill sets needed for those jobs, that's the state that will lead this country in economic development. I want Wisconsin to be that state. <laughs> Part of how we're looking to do that is to tie that in, to tie that into the performance. Uh, many of you may know, others may not know, certainly any of you like me who's a parent, I've still got my youngest son at Wauwatosa East High School, as a parent, I saw early this school year, the report cards that came out. Now the state superintendent of public instruction and I spent about a year working with stakeholders from parents, teachers, administrators, school board members, small business owners, philanthropic interests, you name it. We put together a school and school district accountability system and the product of that uh, were these report cards. Now at the time, we thought there'd be some pushback. 
Because any time you, you put a grade or a score to something, somebody's not going to like that. But we spent so much time creating a transparent and objective system, much to our pleasant surprise, there's been relatively little, if any, opposition. Because I think most, most people know. You know if you've got a great school, you know if you've got a mediocre school, and you know if you've got a failing school, these report cards allowed us to identify that. And so instead of just putting the report cards out, what we're looking to do in the future, and we'll lay out details in our budget on, is to tie performance incentives to schools that not only are high achievers, but those who dramatically improve from year to year. The idea being we want to reward excellence and we want to reward growth. If you're doing what it takes to move your kids up and perform better and better each year, we want to pay you for that. If you're doing what it takes to consistently have high performing schools, we want to pay you for that. And on the flip side of that, if you're in a position where you've got a failing school, and there aren't many, but there are still too many if there's just one in the state, thankfully there's not a lot, but just one is too many. If you're in a school that's failing, we're not going to give you more money to do the same thing. We're going to give you money only and fundamentally if you show us you've got a dynamic turnaround plan, a corrective action plan that will show us what you're going to do to fundamentally change the way you teach, the structure that you have, and the process you use so that the next year you can be rewarded for how much you've grown and improved and gotten out of that failing category. For us, it's all about accountability. It's all about accountability. When I think about this, when I talked two years ago when I was running for governor the first time, uh, running for governor, I guess, it seems like about 20 years ago now, but when I was first running for governor, I, I talked about how everywhere else in life we pay for performance, don't we? I mean, just about every other aspect of life we pay for performance. Why not one of the most important, that being education? That's what we're talking about here, is fundamentally paying for performance, paying for excellence, paying for growth, and paying to fundamentally turn around those schools that aren't living up to those very high expectations we have of our schools, our educators, and ultimately of our students. And we do that. It's not just about getting a good education. It's about ensuring to our employers and to those who look to come into this state that we have the system, we have the pipeline, we have the mechanics to be able to put in place the skilled workers that they need to grow and expand and, and, and to be successful in a great state like the state of Wisconsin. So we're going to continue to do that. Uh, the fourth thing I talk about is reforming government. We want to continue to do that. We're going to be aggressive at doing that, certainly when it comes to taxpayer savings. The Waste, Fraud, and Abuse Commission has come out. We've had a numbers of, of savings there. But, but one of the areas in particular is we want to continue to make our government work better, not just with things we've done, but things we'll do in the future. I want to particularly thank the, uh, the WBA and the help that you provided in terms of the Wisconsin uh, Economic uh, Development Corporation. Um, and, and just talk about that for a minute here and then wrap up with infrastructure. The WDC obviously has gotten a lot of attention in the last, I don't know, three or four months. Um, and without going into every detail, one of the things I want to appreciate is one of the mistakes that was made in the transition was the previous leadership, uh, the CFO in particular, wasn't accounting for where all the dollars were in terms of monitoring loans that had been made in the past. Now, it's important, you all appreciate this, it's important to know that every single one of those loans were not made by the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. They were made by their predecessor. Now, you wouldn't always pick that up in the media. You'd think that they made the loans and then didn't keep track of them. They were made before the WDC came into account. The WDC, admittedly, didn't do a good job of tracking that, and the Wisconsin Bankers Association stepped forward and helped us with a, a great system that uh, has already been not completely implemented, but largely been implemented uh, to ensure that those loans are being cared for in the future. And we not only want to make sure the dollars are being collected, uh, but equally as important, we want to make sure as we go forward, when the corporation does make loans, that we learn from the mistakes that were made from the past administration and from past loans prior to the corporation being set up. But I also want to acknowledge that in addition to those improvements, the WDC overall, and this has largely been overshadowed by a few of these administrative challenges they've had, has been wildly successful. Whether if it's here, if you talk to Thrive, whether it's in the Northeast and you talk to the New North, whether it's in Milwaukee area with the Milwaukee 7, or Momentum West in the Northwest, or many others across the state, they have and will continue to be aggressive in reaching out to partnering to regional, county, and local economic development efforts to make sure there aren't multiple layers, but one spot in which potential employers and existing employers can go to expand the number of jobs and opportunity they have in the state of Wisconsin. 
We're going to continue to be aggressive in doing that. Because even though that goal of 250,000 jobs by 2015 is incredibly ambitious, and there are plenty of excuses about why some could say, well, you know, it's been a tough couple of years. There were the protests and the recalls and the next wave of recalls. And then there were all the financial problems nationally and a slower than expected growth. And uh, there was the fiscal cliff. And there's still uncertainty over the, whether you agree or disagree with the Affordable Care Act. There's still those concerns about the impact of the, uh, the health care exchanges. All those are legitimate reasons why it'd be difficult. We're not here to make excuses. We're here for results. And so our focus is going to be to hunker down, to stay focused, to get things done, to make those sorts of investments that get us on the track, not because we have a campaign pledge to make, but because those 250,000 jobs represent 250,000 families that will benefit because over those four-year period, more jobs, more opportunity were created here in the state of Wisconsin. And so on that fifth uh, option I mentioned, that fifth priority we've got, it's about investments in infrastructure. The most obvious being transportation. We talk about good roads, bridges, uh, highways, uh, certainly ports, airports, freight rail, all those things. Those are important, not just in manufacturing. You think about agriculture, I mean, particularly in the dairy industry, but, but beyond. Uh, and not only with our roads, but even connecting to our ports, where a good chunk of our, our export growth in the past has been through agriculture-related exports, grain going out in other areas. Uh, those are key things for us. We've we got to make sure we've got the infrastructure system for that. On top of that means cost-effective and reliable sources of power. It means in our rural areas making sure we've got access to high-speed internet connection. And it means in our healthcare system, talking about healthcare not from the standpoint of healthcare cost, well that's important and that's an issue that in some ways has been largely taken away from us by the federal government, but in terms of a positive of saying our healthcare system, the infrastructure of that is a net positive in the state. It's a reason why employers and families come here and more importantly, why they stay here because of the strength of our healthcare systems in this state. Those are all things that are part of the priorities we've laid out. Now, we've done that because I believe, and I believe you know it, particularly for those of you who are here today involved in, in banking and finance, you know one of the most important things to your industry and to the industries you help is stability. It's certainty. It's understanding what the next step is. And so while there are a lot of ideas that I and other members of the legislature have that are interesting things for the state to pursue, I've honed in on those five categories and said, that's what we're going to focus in on. That's what we're going to talk about in our budget. That's what we're going to talk about next week in our state of the state. And it's what my hope is the legislature will work with us and focus on. Not because other ideas aren't interesting. Some of them may be uh, novel and legitimate along the way. But my belief is, as much as people have told me over the last two years, they appreciate the tough but important decisions they, we made, as much as people can value the stability that those decisions have brought about, anything that creates any sort of distraction from the certainty and stability needed to create more jobs in the state is taking our eye off the prize. And that's creating more jobs and a better quality of life for all the citizens of our state. So that's where my focus is. I'm optimistic we can get there. Think about where we've been over the last couple of years. Not just in terms of finance and budgets, but think about it. Two years ago, the Statewide Chamber of Commerce did a survey of employers, and in late in 2010, that survey showed only 10% of our employers thought we were heading in the right direction. 2012 showed the same survey, and 94% of our employers thought we were heading in the right direction. Two years ago, Chief Executive Magazine, like they do each year, ranked the best and the worst states to do business in, and we were in the bottom 10. Last year, we moved up to number 20. <coughs> Similar rankings, CNBC moved us up to 17. Site Selector Magazine, which the crew this morning in commercial real estate was particularly interested in, has now moved us up to number 13. The first time since 1998 we've even been in the top 25. The reason I tell you that is I believe the decisions we made not only to improve the economic standing of our state, whether it was through tort reform, tax relief, regulatory relief, repealing the state tax and health savings, got all the things we've done over the last couple of years, but also in terms of the financial stability we brought not only to state but to local government, all those things have contributed to creating a better business climate in this state. And I believe we're going to see that. Now, the other day we got news that we're still not too far from the bottom when it comes to job growth in the past year. I think that's pretty simple. It's because... That survey uh, of employers, that number of, of actual employers out there, came through June. It's a, it's a six-month lag time. In fact, 
one of the things we're hoping to do is create more of a real-time labor management information system so that we can track on a more timely basis instead of having to wait for six months to get an accurate understanding of where our job growth is at in the state. But I think it was pretty simple. And, and if you hear that I've talked to and others across the state tell me, well, it's pretty obvious. The number went through June. For a lot of employers in the state, they said, we're going to wait until after June 5th to figure out what's happening in the state. We like the direction we're headed. We like the way things are going. But we're not willing to go out on a limb to take out that loan, to add on that new equipment, to make that capital investment, to hire those new employees until we know what the next step is. I believe not only through the, the latter six months of this past year, but more importantly going forward, I believe as long as we continue to stay focused on things like those five priorities I talked about, we're going to create the kind of stability in this state that we need, not only for those of you in banking, but for all the other important industries that are reflected here today, for your employers, for your members, for the people that you represent, that's going to give us the kind of optimism and excitement to move forward. And I, I think as we see that, it's only going to compound. It's only going to compound. And so we're committed to doing it. We're committed to moving forward. Most importantly, as I mentioned before, the reason we're committed to it isn't just to hit some sort of a, a bumper sticker from a campaign to hit some sort of a target out there. The reason I laid out 250,000 jobs, the reason I put that number out there is we did it back in the 80s. We can do it again. It took the right policies, the right attitude, and the right approach and a good partnership between an aggressive governor and the legislature that was willing to act with him, but more importantly, employers in that state who were willing to make that kind of impact back at that time a generation ago. I believe we can do it and do it even better here today. And I believe not only can we, I believe we have to. I believe we have to. And for me, it's real simple. I'll end with this. I've got two compelling reasons, none of which are about um, any group that supported me, none are about any organizations that are backing me. There are just two very simple reasons why I believe we have to hit that goal to move this state forward over the next couple of years. One's named Matt, the other's named Alex. Matt is my 18-year-old who's a college freshman. Alex is my 17-year-old who's a senior in high school. For every kid like them across the state, whether it's your son or daughter, grandson or granddaughter, for every kid like this in this state, I don't know about you, but I, for one, want to make sure that they grow up and inherit a state at least, at least as great as the one I grew up in. With your help, with your diligence, with your support along the way, that's exactly what we're going to do. Thank you so much for having me out here today.